Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right. Well, how y'all doing this morning? Hey, it's starting to cool off. Did you notice that? I think it's only going to hit like 103 this week. It's a victory for a Texan. So, hey, I'm Joel. I am the teaching guy around here. I've been gone the last few weeks, but I'm back, and I'm super excited to continue our series, Dirt. Dirt. And you know, when Pastor Marcus told me that was the name of the series, I was like, Dirt. We could go a whole lot of directions with that. Uh, I was reminded of, of a story of a, uh, a young boy sitting with his mom, and um, they're at this funeral, and the preacher is up, you know, saying all these great things, and the preacher gets up, and he says, we are but dust. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. And the little son grabs his mom and says, mom, mom, what is but dust? <laughs> Anyways. Where's my wife? She told me that joke wouldn't work, but it did. I'm just kidding. It's a completely inappropriate joke. But anyways, it'll only go downhill from here. So Y'all hang on. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to see this series of dirt. You know, there actually is a verse where King David, he says this. He says, he remembers our frame. He knows that we are dust. And one of the things my dad always told me growing up, I'd be like, dad, I screwed up again. He's like, you know, the great thing about God is he knows the raw material he's working with. You just dirt. <laughs> and sometimes we're so hard on ourselves and God's like, yeah, I know what I'm dealing with. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep moving forward. I've known, uh, you're, my, my mentor used to say it this way. He's like, God has already accounted for your stupidity in the plan, Joel. Thank God for that. All my dumb mistakes. He's like, yeah, yeah, I already, I already knew you'd do that because you're but dust. So uh, we'll just keep moving along here. So we've been talking about dirt, and we've been talking about this parable of the sower. And Pastor Marcus like set me up for the last three weeks, and I'm going to finish out the next three weeks where we've been talking about uh, kind of the different ways that, that really it's, it's about the different ways we respond to truth. And, uh, you know, as a counselor, I have a master's degree in counseling, and I've been working with people for a lot of years as, in counseling and then serving as a pastor. And one of the things you find with counseling is that people don't come to counseling until the problem has gotten so bad that it's almost like irreparable, Right? So people don't go to marriage counseling until my friend, he he's, works with marriages and his name's Richard. And he says, whenever somebody comes up to me and introduces themselves and says, hey, are you Richard? He's like, my first response is, so how long's your wife been gone, man? He just knows. He's like, by the time they come talk to me, it's probably she's already left the house. Because isn't that the truth about us? We don't go and ask for help until it's so bad. And I found in personal counseling as well, which honestly, I'm convinced there are no marriage problems. There are just people with problems that bring them to marriage. Uh, it's just kind of the nature of things. We all got issues. And uh, when, when you come to, pers- to like individual counseling, what I've found is people usually come to counseling when things have gotten so bad, they just can't take the pain anymore. Like the problem's been there for years, and then they show up and they want it fixed instantly. And some of you right now are in the challenge. They're like, man, I need this fix. And I, listen, I want to encourage you with something. You didn't get here overnight. It took you 10 years to mess this up. So just chill out. You'll get it fixed, but it's going to take a little while, okay? So you keep doing the right thing over and over again. And what happens in counseling typically is when somebody comes to counseling, we figure out in the first session what needs to be fixed. It just comes really clear, and they're like, oh, my gosh. I just saw for the first time what I need to fix. But then this is typically the way they respond. They say this. Well, I know that's true, but, right? So here's one I hear all the time. I know I should forgive him, but that would be letting him off the hook, and he doesn't deserve it. And that takes the power away from me if I forgive him. So I know that's true. I know it's true that I should forgive, Joel, but you don't know what he did. It was really, really bad. You've got a butt for that. Here's one. I know we really need to get our finances on a budget, but I don't need that budget cramp in my style. I don't want some piece of paper telling me how I'm going to spend my money. What if something, what if something comes up that I really need and deserve? Anybody relate to that? Don't, don't punch your husband next to you. All right. 
Here's this one. I know I should tithe, but man, inflation right now and that extra 10% every month could really go a long way towards those golf clubs. <laughs> you know, there's all these things. Here's another one I hear a lot. Man, I know I should probably let go of this plan that I've had that's just not working. But if I do that, that would mean I failed and I won't get what I want. And everybody around you is like, dude, your plan's just not working. You're like, yeah, but if I push just brute force, try a little bit harder, I know I can make this thing happen. We've all got these, yeah, I know that's true, but, right? And you, like, you start adding these things, and you fill it in here. I know that's true, but this, but that, but that. And what do you end up here with? You end up with this huge hole. And what does that make this? <laughs> anyway, let's move along. We've all got butts when truth comes up. And, and so this parable of the sower is really, it's, it's about this. How will you respond to truth when it's presented? And Jesus is saying that there's these four kinds of dirt. And the cool thing is you get to decide what kind of dirt you're going to be. You get to decide when truth comes to me, because truth is always being presented to us, isn't it? We find out stuff that we're like, ugh. But the problem with truth is it requires we do something with it. Because when you realize truth is like, you've been believing something that wasn't true and you find truth, you always have to go, oh no, now I have to adjust my life to it. And that's the kicker, isn't it? And, and what's worse about it is when somebody you don't even really like tells you some truth, like your husband. <laughs> You're like, oh, I know that's true, but that guy makes me so mad sometimes, Right? Or maybe some, somebody on the other side of the political spectrum says something that's got some truth to it, and you're like, I know that's true, but those people, I can't stand those people. And so we end up blowing off truth. And Jesus is saying, in fact, what he says about this, we're going to read in a second. He says, if you can figure out, like, if you can't figure out this parable, this story he told, you're not going to get any of the rest of them. Because how you respond to truth defines how you're going to respond to God doing his work in your life. Right. And most of us have some buts. I don't, uh, yeah, I know that's true. And I'm not talking about even when you've been, like, you don't even know it's true. I'm talking about when it's blatantly true. It's one thing to have been lied to and believed a lie. I'm talking about when you, you, know, you just know it's right in front of you and you're like, yeah, but I just don't like the way they presented that truth. You ever had that? They didn't have to do it so rudely. Yeah, but it's still truth. So how are you going to respond when truth is presented? So Jesus, he tells this parable and Listen, there are multiple layers to every parable you read in the Bible. The Bible will never get old. I've been hanging out in the church for 45 years. And I, as I was reading this, preparing for this message, I saw truths in this parable that I've never seen before. And I thought I had this one wrapped up. I was like, yeah, I know what that one's about. And I read it. I'm like, wow, there's way more truth in this. Because truth is this huge thing that we can only handle a little bit of it at a time. And when it's presented, you got to go, okay, I'm going to see this new truth to it. And throughout your life, if you've been walking with the Lord a while, you probably see if you get back in your Bible, the truths will present themselves in a new way because you've changed. You see life a little bit differently, but the truth stays the truth and it reveals itself even more and more in our lives. So Jesus, he's telling this parable of the sower. And one of the weird things about Jesus is like, he would tell these parables and a lot of times he would just kind of leave them out there hanging. So this parable, he told the parable, he's like, hey, this guy goes out to sow seed and there's all these dirt and blah, blah, blah. And then he says this, and he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he walks away. You go, well, what? Now, as, as a preacher's kid, I get frustrated when, a, when a, 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 I'm watching somebody on TV or something or a preacher, they say something and they just kind of leave it hanging. I'm like, so what's the application? I can't stand, like, I was thinking about this week, like I, I, they call me the teaching pastor here. I'm like, maybe it should be the teaching and application pastor because I think there's nothing worse than somebody just being like, Boop, and then not helping you apply it to your life. <laughs> so Jesus doesn't even apply this though. So the disciples, they're kind of like, Jesus, what? Like you have all these people listening. They want truth. What's the deal? And they said, so then when he was alone, the disciples are hanging out with him. Those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. I said, Jesus, what the heck was that all about? Like, great story, but what does that even mean? I can imagine Peter was the, probably the first one to speak up. He was always the first one to speak. Like, what the heck was that all about? And so Jesus says this, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, 
But for those outside, everything is in parables. So that, and then he quotes Isaiah 6. And Isaiah 6, Isaiah was a prophet from the Old Testament. And Isaiah has this vision where he says, God, send me. And God says, all right, I'm going to send you out to speak truth. But I just want you to know that when you speak that truth, they may indeed see, but they won't perceive what you're trying to say. And they may indeed hear, but they won't understand. Lest they should turn and be forgiven. And, and another version of this is, lest they should turn and be healed. And how often, he's saying, if, they'll, if they would accept the truth, they would understand things, they would perceive it, and they would, maybe, they would even be healed. And how often do we hold back our own healing because we refuse to look at a truth that's in front of us because it will require a change in our behavior? Forgiveness, I hate to keep harping on that. That's a great example. But forgiveness, man, the only person it harms is you. The person that hurt you, they've moved on with their life. You're holding on to it. It's destroying you. It's actually having physical effects in your body. And you're like, yeah, but to let them go and to accept what Jesus said that I've got to forgive, that would mean to let them off the hook. And it's like, they don't care. The only person in prison is you. Right. you know, they say prison uh, uh, forgiveness is letting the prisoner free and then realizing you were the one behind the bars. And that's an example. You say, wow, man, I could be healed of this, but it's going to require me doing something that's hard. And that's what we're going to talk about this week is when things get hard. But I want to set this up a little bit because Jesus says, he says this. So he says, he does this weird parable and then he goes and, and I think what he was talking about is something that Winston Churchill said. He says this, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. Anybody relate to that? Men, your wife tells you something you didn't want to hear. You're like, you kind of look around. Did anybody see that? <laughs> and you move along, right? Truth is always speaking to us. And if you're reading your Bible, truth is always speaking to you. And you'll read something, you'll go, that's just not realistic, Jesus. Turn the other cheek? I don't know about that. Truth is presenting itself. And the question is, like, are you going to stumble over it and act like it never happened? Or are you going to receive it? And I think that's what Jesus was kind of alluding to. Uh, well, Winston Churchill was alluding to what Jesus said that. So then he goes on and he picks, up the, he picks up the parable. And this is what he says. He said to them, guys, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? He said, until you get this, you're not going to get anything I say. Because these parables are principles that show how life works in truth. When you do this, you get this. When you do this, you get this. And, and so much of wisdom in life is understanding processes that God put into place. And when you do this, you're going to get this. So he says, guys, you really got to understand what this is about. So, in, so because you got to understand this, I'm actually going to unpack this parable for you and explain exactly what I'm talking about. He says, the sower sows the word. Jesus is the sower. This word, word, is actually the same word in John where it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word is logos, logion. It, it literally, it means the truth. When Jesus showed up, he was the truth incarnate in the flesh, speaking truth to us. So he says, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Now, I started unpacking this, and I'm thinking, okay, Pastor Marcus talked about this last week. How does, how does Satan possibly take truth away from you? He has one method, and he uses it over and over consistently, and it always works. Lies and deception. Satan, it says, in fact, there's this one verse where Jesus, among the kinder and nicer words he said to these Pharisees, he said, you guys are the sons of your father, Satan. And he's a liar. He's been a liar from the beginning. Satan always deals in lies. He distorts the truth. And here's what's really interesting about this. Do you, inter you notice he compares it to a path? Do you know how a path is formed? A path is formed when a bunch of people start going, that's the easiest way to get over there. And they start walking that way. And everybody's like, oh, that must be the easiest way to go. And they keep following. Isn't it interesting that he compares Satan's lies to a path? It's always easier to believe the lie. And some of us, we willingly believe lies other people tell us because we just, I mean, to God forbid, thinking that somebody in the government would lie to you. That means the people in charge aren't trustworthy. What do you do if the people in charge aren't trustworthy? Like somebody's got to be trustworthy. It's a scary thought. And listen, there are some personality types, honestly, that would rather believe a lie if it's a guarantee than the actual truth of the situation. And so we're prone not only to believe the lies of others if it seems like the easier path, 
but we're prone to believe our own lies if it's the easier path. And Satan always believes in lies. And some of you have believed, some of you got a lie planted in you early on in life about who you are or how the world works, about who's safe and who's unsafe, or what, what you can do and what you can't do. And it's a lie the enemy has been effectively using to put you on the path of least resistance. Victimhood is one of those lies. And you fall into this attitude, well, it's, I, there's nothing I can do about this. It's all these people out there that are doing these horrible things that are keeping me down. And victimhood will keep you trapped. But it's a lie. There is something you can do. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just change your attitude. But there's always something in control you have control of to change. But if you believe the lie, then you'll just go with the path of least resistance. I had two mentors. Last week, I got to spend a whole week with one of my mentors from high school. He's been a mentor of mine for years. Him and his wife both. I call them for everything. Every decision I make, I kind of run it past them. Big decisions. And I remembered that at the time that I met him, there were two Two people in my life, two adults that were speaking into me. And one of them, he affirmed everything I did. And, and I, I was always getting in trouble in high school. Okay? Most of the time, it was for stuff I said to adults that I shouldn't have said. <laughs> I would find myself in the principal's office. And this one guy, this one teacher, he would always call. After I get sent to the principal's office, he'd be like, hey, I heard you got sent to the principal's office. You keep speaking truth to power, man. Those people need this. Keep speaking the, speaking the truth. And I'm like, yeah, this guy values what I bring to the table. <laughs> and then I'd get sent to the principal's office again. And he'd be like, yeah, you keep speaking the truth. And what I came to find out later is this guy had some major beef with the administration at the school. So he just loved there was a punk kid that he could use to do his bidding. There was another guy in my life, the guy that became my lifelong mentor, and he told me this. The first time I met him, I just like had an experience with the principal's office. Like, These people, blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and he goes, you are an idiot. <laughs> it's like, David, what? He's like, yeah, dude. He's like, you need to learn to keep your mouth shut until you know all the details. And I remember first I was like, who is this guy? Like, <laughs> and you know who became my lifelong mentor? David. Because he would tell me the truths I didn't want to hear about myself. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. And how often do we choose to believe the lies somebody tells us that affirm what we want to do anyways, rather than the truth that's right in front of us, because that's just a lot more work. So the path, the path response is to accept a lie rather than truth. And listen, that's what most people do. I think that's why Jesus listed it first. I think most people choose a lie because it requires less work over the truth, the truth of personal responsibility, the truth of recognizing that you have a part to play in like making your decisions and seeking the Lord on your own. And you don't have, don't go look into the past or you need to hear from the Lord yourself on what you're supposed to do in your unique situation. So that's the first one, right? And the second response, he says this, he goes on, he says, and those are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones when they went to hear, they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Now, if you heard the gospel presented correctly, the gospel literally means good news. The gospel is very good news. And some of you guys remember the first time you couldn't even believe it, that somebody would love you and forgive you unconditionally in spite of all the bad, horrible, dumb things you did. And you're like, that's really good news. And it is good news, man. It is the best news. But it's just the beginning of the good news. Here's the really good news. God loves you so much that he's not going to let you stay the same way you are. And this is where the good news gets a little bit challenging, where it talks about like we receive the good news, like, oh, I'm loved unconditionally, but that's just the beginning of salvation. So let me give you a little theology here. Don't zone out on me. This is really simple and easy, but I'm going to explain something powerful to you. Salvation comes in three parts, okay? The first part is what's called justification, Justification is that aha moment where you go, oh my gosh, I've sinned. Jesus paid the price for my sins. And when I stand before God, it's just as if justified, never sinned. That's an amazing concept. When God looks at you, if you've given your life to him and surrendered your sin and your life over to him, when he looks at you, all he sees is the perfection of Jesus. And that's just the beginning. Because the next step, that was justification. The next step is called sanctification. And this is the process whereby God gets you in line with what he says is best for you. And this is where it gets really hard. Because this is where the truth starts being presented that, man, you've got a real problem with your mouth and the things you say. Man, I've got a real problem with addiction and 
being way too dependent on this substance over here. Man, I really am kind of borderline abusive with my spouse in the way I talk to her. And all these truths get presented, and that's when the rubber meets the road, and you go, hold up, I got to change my behavior? I thought this was just about Jesus loving me. It is, but he loves you so much, he's not going to let you stay the same. And he starts pushing you, and you go, oh, this is uncomfortable. Like, I don't like this. And so many people, I meet so many people that, man, right when they're about to get a breakthrough, they're like, I'm leaving that church. They started judging me. Like, what do you mean they judged you? Well, they, they were telling me my lifestyle wasn't, wasn't good. Like, what do you mean? Well, I was with this guy, and, and they said he wasn't the right guy for me. And, and, and I say, listen, were they judging you, or were they calling greatness out of you that you couldn't even see in yourself? Because sometimes we've been so beat down by the lies, we can't even see what God has put in us, but others can. And they're saying, hey, rise up out of that thing you're living in that's not what he wants for you, and step up to something better. But we go, well, they judged me. And you walk away and you miss out on what God could have done to make you even more of who he believes you can be that you don't even believe about yourself. That's the sanctification process. And it's really uncomfortable. And then there's this final process. It's called glorification. It's this moment where it says, when we see him, we will be like him and we are known as we are known. We will know as we are known. That's when either you go and meet him in the sky, like he either shows up or whatever your eschatology is. I don't know where I stand on all that. But one of these days, you want to stand before Jesus, and that's when glorification will happen. But in the process, we're right now in this sanctification process where God is saying, hey, I know what you have the potential to be, and don't give up. But this is the stony ground response. When, when it gets hard, and it gets beyond just the fuzzies of, oh, Jesus loves me, and I'm forgiven of my sins, it gets hard, and we give up, and we walk away because it's difficult Chesterton, my favorite author, he says, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. When you really get down to what God asks of you, you go, oh, whoa, whoa, that's really hard. I'm not, I didn't sign up for this. And it is what you signed up for, but you probably didn't realize it in the beginning. It says, it's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance, right? We repent, and then he says, now begins the fun process of, I love you so much, I'm not going to let you stay the same. I'm going to push you to become all you could be. And this is where Paul says this fascinating verse. He says this, therefore, since we've been justified, that's that word I just shared with you, justified. It's like, you've been justified by faith. It wasn't anything you did. God gave you the gift of grace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have accepted the gift of Christ, God is not mad at you. He's forgiven you, and all he sees is Jesus in you. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And he says, but that's just the beginning. Not only that, we don't just sit around rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. That's the start. But we also rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said it this way, he said, when God calls a person, he bids them come and die. And that's the part of the process we don't like. He says, hey, I've saved you from your sins. Now it's time to die to yourself and what you used to hold on to. And this is what it's it's been called the wisdom pattern. This is the process in life. I didn't make a slide for this, but write this down. This is super important because this process you will repeat over and over and over again in life. The process is this. First comes life, then comes death, then comes resurrection and glory. But first you have to be willing to face the death that you you don't want to face. And some of, sometimes he calls us to die to stuff that's become so part of our identity that to die to it would literally feel like you're actually dying. To actually take responsibility for yourself in some areas where God's like, hey, you're not a victim here. I've given you all power through the Holy Spirit to rise up and become all I've called you to be. You can't be blaming others for your situation. You've got to step up. And it could feel like dying to, to, to die to that old way of thinking. But you don't get to the glorious resurrection until you're willing to go through the challenging death. That's the process. Life, then death, then resurrection power and glory. Jesus exemplified it for us. And the craziest thing is, here's the really challenging thing. The only way that we're transformed is through two things, right? 
We're transformed through, tr- through, through truth, obviously, but it's the truth that we experience first in an experience of great love. Some of you, you just could not believe that someone could love you unconditionally because of the way you were treated growing up and you experienced the love of Jesus and you're like, I can't believe this. And it transformed you. And then the second way we're transformed is through an experience of great suffering and surrender to truth in great suffering. And I don't know about you, but for me, suffering does the trick better (laughs) most of the time. And I wish it wasn't that way, but I'm hard-headed and suffering's usually the only thing that wakes me up. That's why people end up in counseling when it's gotten so bad, because suffering wakes us up. And we go, whew, I gotta do something about this. Truth is right there and suffering wakes us up to it. And that's how Paul says, look, I want you to see your suffering a little bit differently. Now listen, there's unnecessary suffering. That's suffering we do just from stupid stuff, but there's a necessary suffering. And that's the suffering where God just allows things into our life that we go, why? And he's like, stop asking why. Ask, how am I going to respond to this? And so he says, we can rejoice in our suffering because here's what suffering is doing for you. It's creating endurance. It's putting those roots deeper and deeper and deeper. Because remember what he says in the parable. He says, the one with no roots, when it gets hard, they're just going to, they're going to fail. So he's, he's creating endurance and endurance produces character. Your grandmother was right that all that suffering, she's like, yeah, it builds character. She was right. And character produces hope. And hope will not put you to shame because you can be confident that God's love has been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to you to guide you in all truth as it's presented and you surrender to that truth. So when life gets hard and that suffering wakes you up to truth, what are you going to do? You're going to turn tail and run and go, this is just too hard? Or are you going to say, apparently God's got big plans for me. And that's why he's allowing this thing into my life. And I don't know where your theology is on it. I don't know where my theology is on it. But either way, bad stuff happens. And you've got to figure out how am I going to respond to it. And a lot of people, they give up and run right when things are about to get good. Right when God's like, all right, this is where we're going to grow you. And, and I was talking to an olive gardener yesterday. It's like she grow, raises olives right here in Seguin, actually. And uh, I was saying, what's the hardest part of raising olives? And she's like, you've got to keep, keep on the pruning I said, what do you mean? She goes, because these olives, they keep popping out shoots that actually take away nutrients from the most important fruit. She's like, so you're always pruning. And I started thinking about what Jesus said in one of the parables. He says, um, he says my father is the vine dresser. And he says, uh, if you're producing fruit, you'll get pruned. So you produce better fruit. And if you're not producing fruit, you'll get pruned. So you're getting pruned one way or another. <laughs> Great news. But the key in those moments is to recognize that you know the thing he's using to prune you the struggles you're going through with your spouse, the financial challenges. Keep your eyes off the pruning shears and on the one doing the pruning. Because the father is the one doing the pruning. And he's saying, I know this is going to (laughs) hurt. I'm going to snip this off over here. So there's a lot of room up here for the fruit to grow. But we get so focused on the thing that's causing the suffering, right? This, this, if I could just get this out of my life. And God's like, no, no, I'm actually using that to transform you in that sanctification process so you can die to those things that are taking away from your ability to produce the greatest fruit and potential in your life. So what kind of dirt are you going to be? My prayer is that in in two more weeks, we're going to talk about the dirt that produces lots of fruit. But it's our decision. Are we going to be those that choose the lie and go with the easy path and Are we going to be those that give up when things get hard? And this week, some truth's going to be presented to you. It may come from somebody you don't like. But are you going to go, ah, yeah, I know that's true, but no, 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 I don't like that person. Maybe it's going to come from your wife. Men, get over yourself. Listen to her. She knows some stuff. God forbid God would speak through your husband, too. I mean, he may be your husband. You're like, that guy? How did, where did he come up with that? You've been watching, you know. Sometimes God will speak through your husband. What are you going to do when truth comes? And my prayer is that we'll be those who receive the truth and let it take deep root and grow us into who he says we can be. And when it gets hard, we start stretching us and we're like, ah, I don't like this. That's when you know it's working, when it starts stretching you. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you have great plans for us. You have a future for us a destiny for us. And I just thank you, Lord, as we surrender to your truth in our life, you bring fruit in our lives. So I pray for everyone this week that's 
however truth's going to present itself, whether it's through a boss that we can't stand or through a spouse that drives us crazy sometimes, whatever the truth or as we're reading our Bible this week, Lord, I pray that that truth would come and get deep into our souls and we would say, all right, I'm not going to have any buts or excuses for this. I'm going to surrender to this and do whatever it takes to get my life in line with the truth. If you're here this morning and you have not gotten your life in line with the truth that Jesus forgave you of your sins, that you've sinned, that he wants to forgive you of that, and he wants to set you up with an eternal address with him, I'm going to give you a chance in just a second when we say this prayer to give your life to him and set you on an eternal path of walking with him. It starts when we say this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Hey, if you just said that prayer, you've started on the journey. Welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources in the back of the guest services to help you. You guys can stand. I pray this week you will be blessed. Walk in truth wherever you find it. This is your last week to sign up for small groups. Get in a small group. You guys are dismissed. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>